Hi there, this is Josh from Literary Gladiators, and today I'm here with a book haul. Uh, I was on uh, a vacation from work uh, the, uh, last week, and I happened to visit uh, three bookstores in three days, and they are smaller bookstores. I'm going to be putting aside some uh, used bookstore hauls, and we're going to have a used bookstore haul marathon. But today I'm going to be talking about just a general independent bookstore that I paid a visit to, and that is River Road Books in Fairhaven, New Jersey. Plus, I'll be sharing with you a bonus book that I bought at a cheese restaurant. So let's just get right into it. First thing I picked up was The Oregon Trail, A New American Journey by Rinker Buck. And when I was growing up, I used to enjoy playing The Oregon Trail on the computer. My grandmother had the computer game, and it would show you all of the different sites, and you would have to make uh, critical thinking-based decisions uh, as to how much uh, supplies you would take, and how you would cross the rivers. And in this story, uh, someone uh, goes on the Oregon Trail in the modern day, but using the implements of the 19th century. So, he uses a covered wagon and mules in order to uh, take the truck westward which is quite interesting to see what the modern-day mentality brings to something that was uh, the way of heading west about 160 plus years ago. So I'm really excited to check that out. Next thing I picked up was the quartet orchestrating the Second American Revolution 1783 to 1789 by Joseph J. Ellis. And it follows George Washington, James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, and John Jay in the development of America after the Revolution and before. Washington assumes the presidency and has to do with the development of the Articles of Confederation and the uh, Bill of Rights, which we also know as the uh, U.S. Constitution. This should definitely be interesting. It caught my attention. And something that especially caught my attention for how uh, poignant it sounded, because there was just such a yearning to it, and that was uh, He Wanted the Moon, which is the madness and medical genius of Dr. Perry Barb and his daughter's quest to know him. Dr. Barb uh, was uh, looking for a... He was looking for answers regarding manic depression, which he himself was dealing with, and he... In, while all of this was happening, he was mentally declining to the point that he had to be institutionalized. And following a lobotomy, uh, it caused him to take a seizure that would ultimately kill him. And his, uh, his work was not complete at the time of his death. And the... Uh, but this uh, book itself uh, has to do with his daughter's uh, quest to find out more about him and the many of extraordinary things he has done. And uh, this is beyond... Uh, he was actually working on this uh, research and trying to get this discovery together while he was institutionalized, which... He really had his mindset on accomplishing this particular goal of 
finding an answer to the problems of manic depression. And that is just, that, that's just, it's a shame what had happened to him. And I'm really looking to explore more about the details. Next thing I picked up was uh, the uh, bind-up of uh, Murakami's first two works. Hear the Wind Sing, which was number one, and Pinball 1973, which was number two. And Hear the Wind Sing, and both of these were written at his kitchen table in the hours before sunrise, as it says in here. And a lot of this is influenced by uh, Western culture. Uh, in uh, I know uh, Pinball 1973 having to do with a man's uh, interest in uh, pinball with all of the strange things going on in his life. And with regard to Hear the Wind Sing, it's a very... it's a guy coming home for summer break and just making the most out of it. And it seems like it is that feel-good work or the yearning to feel good, which I'm interested to see uh, how these come out. I know that people uh, have brought this up. Uh, Taylor from T. Reads in particular has uh, expressed how she was reading this and enjoying it. Next one I wanted to share is Matterhorn, Novel of the Vietnam War, by Carl Marlantes, which has to do with these young boys heading into war, into the Vietnam jungle, and how they are required by circumstance to become men, which they're... 18 years old, per, I would say they're 18 years old, on average, uh, and they're being thrown right into adulthood and fetching for themselves. But it's not necessarily the, uh, the elements of war that one initially thinks of, and the fact that they would have to fight off uh, their enemy combats, but this particular novel also explores the more naturalist struggles, such as the land conditions and the need, the need to survive, just the basic uh, survival needs that uh, come with being in war. And it reminds me heavily of uh, the things they carried by Tim O'Brien, or at least that's what uh, is coming off with the premise. And I did my uh, senior thesis on the things they carried, and it seems as if this is very similar, especially since Marlantes was in Vietnam himself, which is always crucial in writing a uh, raw war story. The next thing that caught my attention and I had to pick up was Writing the Life by H.W. Brands, which is a biographical piece that follows the life and times of our 40th President of the United States in Ronald Reagan, who lived from 1911 to 2004 and served as president from 1981 to 1989. So, the 1980s were deemed the Reagan years, and he revolutionized things so that they flowed his way, and he heavily inspires conservatives, and he is the go-to uh, person when it comes to a champion for uh, conservative rights among the Republican Party. In addition to influencing uh, American politics, especially among Republicans, uh, 
Reagan was also instrumental in uh, ending communism in Russia. One of his uh, major moments was when he urged uh, Mikhail uh, Gorbachev to tear down the uh, Berlin Wall. And this is, pr from what I'm seeing, it is a general biography, not necessarily concentrating on one particular point in his uh, career, but I'm still interested in seeing how Brands approaches this. And the last thing I got was from a place called the Cheese Cave, which I really enjoyed going to. I had a nice uh, cheese board that they put together based off of uh, cheeses that I was interested in trying. And they happen to have a book there called uh, Mastering Cheese, which is, uh, it was written by Max McCallman and also features uh, contributions from David Gibbons. But when I went to uh, Disney World uh, six years ago, I, uh, the only thing I had gotten there, uh, souvenir-wise or anything, was uh, the cheese plate, which was uh, McCallman's other uh, book. And he has one other one simply called Cheese, and I think I'm going to have to look for that one too. But mastering cheese has to do with connoisseurship and learning what it takes to what you need to know in order to become a, a cheese connoisseur. And after reading The Cheese Plate, I really uh, see a lot in uh, Max McCallum. And I'm looking forward to... Uh, and he's also... I'm looking forward to getting to this. And he's pretty funny with the way that he uh, expresses himself. Uh, expressing his championship for good cheeses, uh, preferably raw milk, and also expressing his distaste for cheeses that he can't stand. For instance, for, to him processed cheese is cheese food. And when he's talking about artisan cheeses, uh, the chapter is, there is no Swiss cheese, Switzerland's best. What he means is, there's no Swiss cheese that we perceive as that cheese with the holes, or more, uh, uh, in a more correct form, that cheese with eyes. Ready? Just show you everything I got. Here's my stack. Thank you for tuning into this video, and as always, I encourage you to keep reading.